Welcome back to IEP Breakdown. Today is section four of the six sections of our IEP Breakdown series. And today we'll, we will be discussing sections five, six, and seven. And we will be talking about um, IEP services, placement data, and authorizations. So as a reminder, you're going to need to have a few, a few tools out. You're going to need your IEP breakdown tool, your IEP breakdown instructions, your initial IEP interview, which is a two page front and back page document. You need your IEP action plan, your outside of school action plan, your current and one year past IEP, your current quarterly progress for 12 months, and you will also need a pen and a highlighter. So today we're going to start first with section five, which is services, and I'm going to switch over to an actual IEP. And we will start there. So this is page one of the services section of the IEP. And this is the state's IEP tool. So if you are home and looking at a local or a county IEP, your form may look different. So at the state level, they provide a lot of information, a lot of provider services and types of services. You may not see that in your local county IEP because they do have um, permission to change how they present their IEP. So what you want to do is get familiar with this tool and recognize on the left hand side you will see nature of services. You will see the location where you can select within the general ed classroom or outside of general ed classroom. There's the description, the service description, which is the number of sessions the length of time in hours or minutes, and then the frequency. And oftentimes the way you'll see it is um, a child might receive a service, say one service for 20 minutes once a week, or they might get three times a week for 20 or 30 minutes on a weekly basis. And it will always be assigned a start and an end date. And that is the start date is when the new IEP is due. And the end date is 364 days from that date. So it's basically a one year period, but the next IEP has to be done within one year. So that's where those dates come from. Um, under the provider section, you will see many options of who can provide the service to your child. And most of the time, it's pretty logical, like if you're getting speech services, it will be the speech and language pathologist who provides the service, or if you're getting audiology services, that would be provided by an audiologist. There are occasions where it's not um, as clear cut, as that. So for example, if you're working on um, behavior goals, you may have the general educator, the special educator, the guidance counselor, um, maybe the school social worker or school counselor. You can have several people working on that IEP goal and then there would be a primary, but um, everyone may have some input or they could just select the entire IEP team so that everyone has um, impact on that goal. And then the summary of service is the total amount of time that they receive for within a week, a month or a year. So it just depends on how that is being evaluated. So underneath that, they have extended school year services and you go through the same thing. Um, how much is in classroom instruction? They have physical ed, um, speech and language therapy, travel training or different examples. You go through the same process of design, um, designating where the service is provided, how frequency and how much time it's provided each time and um, the beginning and end dates. 
So very similar. So you're going to go through this for special ed services. You're also going to go through this for all related services. And all of your related services are listed on the left hand side, like audiological, psychological, occupational, physical therapy, recreational, early identification and assessment, counseling services, health services, social work services, um, parent counseling and training, O&M orientation and mobility is usually for students who are blind or visually impaired. Um, medical services, other therapies, interpreting services, speech and language, and nursing services. So all of these are different types of services that can be provided. They're all considered related services. And again, you go through the same process of identifying how much of it happens in the general ed classroom, outside of the general ed classroom. The frequency is usually done on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, and then they tally up the total amounts of time. And then who is providing this service? So what's most important to recognize is that for the parents, you have equal input as an equal member of the IEP team. You have say and your voice matters in advocating the services and supports that you want for your child. So if the school is suggesting that your child gets 20 minutes of um, speech and language services once a week and um, provided in the, uh, let's say that it's inside the general ed classroom, you may not agree with how that's set up. And maybe you would like it to be three times a week at 20 or 30 minutes. You, you have the right to advocate for a different amount of time if you think that they need more. You have the right to advocate for how they receive the services. Um, it could be in the general ed classroom. It could be outside of the general ed classroom. It could be half in, half out. It could be once a week in, twice a week out. You have say and you just have to be prepared to advocate and explain what your rationale is for why you want the service delivered that way. So for example, if you have a child with um, maybe expressive, receptive, and pragmatic delays, maybe you want them to have some small group settings in a pullout instruction where they specifically work on pragmatic skills. But they have such a significant articulation disorder that you also want them to receive one-on-one -on -one services out of the classroom. And then maybe inside the classroom, you want some time where the speech therapist is just observing how they're learning and participating in the classroom and providing coaching prompts and reminders so that they can stay on task and equally participate with their peers. So that might be a push in service into the gen ed setting. So you can advocate based on the needs of your child, but sometimes um, parents are not aware that they have the right to ask for more or how the delivery, how the service is delivered, but all of that is negotiable. The frequency, the length of time, who provides the service, all of that is negotiable. So I like this tool because it gives you an idea of all of the services that do exist that are provided out there and um, gives you a better sense of what you may or may not need for your child versus what they're actually currently getting. So always remember that if you do not agree, if you in the school system, the, I, the rest of the IEP team cannot come to an agreement on the service to be provided, you always have the right to ask for prior written notice. And again, prior written notice is requesting that the school document the fact that the parent and the rest of the IEP team do not agree. The, the school is expected to document what you are requesting and the school's reason for denying that service. So that should become part of the permanent um, IEP meeting minutes and it is called prior written notice. So anytime there's a disagreement, you always wanna make sure that you have prior written notice documented. And then one thing I'd like to do is before we move on from looking at services. Oh, let me slide down here. So 
the next page of services, this is career and technology education. So this is for kids of transitioning age. You want, if you're trying to get them more um, employment skills ready for graduation, you would select services from here as well. And I'm going to scroll all the way back to page one because I just want to remind people, this is very important, that on page one, on the bottom right hand side, right where this little hand is, there is a line that says areas affected by disability. And it's such an important little line, but it's often overlooked. And what I want parents to remember is that any area of need that your child has should be reflected in this line. And if they need another line or if they need to add to it, it's so important. Um, it looks like it's a small amount, like you could just fit one or two words in there. But if, if a child has a complex disability with multiple areas that are affected, you want to make sure that every single area of need is listed here because you want to have a goal for each area. So as you're working through this whole process, you want to make sure that this is complete so that when you think of your child holistically, there's no area that is not reflected. There's no area of need that is not reflected on this line. And then everything that's on this line should have a goal. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, so that is really all you need to know about section five of the IEP. Okay, so next we're going to talk about section six, which is placement data. And placement data cannot be determined until sections one through five of the IEP have been determined. So you have to have a really solid understanding of the child's needs, their um, present levels of performance, the goals and objectives, and all of the services before you can even begin to talk about placement. So an important term that parents need to understand is a term called least restrictive environment, and they call that LRE. And basically what le least restrictive environment means is that the student with a disability should not be removed from the general education and age appropriate instructional setting for any more than absolutely necessary. So the only time that they should be removed from that gen ed age appropriate setting is because they need services that they cannot receive in the general education setting. So um, if you have a child with complex needs or complex behaviors, they may be some reasons to consider um, pulling them out of the gen ed setting. But most students should try, uh, the schools will try to put your child in a general education setting and then just pull them out maybe for some special ed pullouts or small group instruction outside the classroom as much as possible. And only when that setup does not work would they look at um, a more restrictive environment for the child. So they sort of separated out for ages three through five and then special ed placement for ages six through 21. But it's really about how much time is in the general ed setting, outside of the general ed setting, and then um, more restrictive placements might be instead of solely in the general ed setting or having some pullouts, a, neck, a more restrictive placement might be like a special education school or a special education program like a Strive program or a John Archer school. And then more restricted than that, um, like the most restrictive program might be something like a non-public placement. So none of these decisions can be made until the entire IEP is determined and when you make the decision for more restrictive placement, you have to document the reason for the decision. 
and how the services will be provided if they're not to be provided within the student's home school. So there's a series of questions that they run through that talks about the placement and they have to document why they can't provide the placement in the home school. And there is, um, for, for a non-public placement, there is a term that parents should be familiar with, which is that when the school system is unable to provide the child's educational needs in the home school, that is when they would consider a non-public placement. And that is a huge undertaking and it is not determined through a general IEP meeting. It requires a central IEP meeting, um, but it, it can be done when it's appropriate, but they have to take all the steps to determine that the least restrictive options are not suitable before they can consider a non-public placement. And then um, if they get to the point, then they also look at consideration for transportation. So that is also discussed here. And if a child is to receive a special, special school placement, again, like the STRIVE program or John Archer or a non-public placement, then the school automatically does provide transportation to that child. And any additional transportation accommodations that may be required would be documented here. And then they also provide, um, they, they wanna make sure that students have the opportunity to participate with non-disabled peers in academic, non-academic and extracurricular activities as much as possible. And that is just based on the concept that children learn best having healthy peers, healthy uh, neurotypical role models so whenever possible, we wanna try and have them in that least restrictive environment again. So this page here determines placement and provides you all of the different eligibility codes. And that is the end of placement. Okay, I'm gonna go right into section seven. Okay, in section seven, we're going to talk about the authorizations that are needed to complete the IEP process. So on this first page here, we will see consent for initiation of services. And when the child is to receive an IEP for the very first time, um, it does require parental signature. So at the bottom, um, the parent has to agree that they want the child to receive services. So all they do is sign and date this form. But it also explains that in the event that the, that the parent decide that they don't like their child receiving special education services and that they want to revoke consent, that that consent is not retroactive. So that means basically that the school is not obligated to eliminate all records of special education that the child received. Once the child receives special education services, that becomes a permanent part of their education record. So that is what you need to know from this page. And on the next page, this is the medical assistance form. All right, so this page is for medical assistance and what, what the school is asking for is for parental consent so that the school may bill medical assistance for services provided to the child through the school system. So any services such as OT, PT, speech and language therapy, they can bill for that service to medical assistance. Um, however, they cannot bill without authorization. So this is just allowing consent. So the parent would need to provide the MA number and um, their signature and date. And then if they, if they do consent to this form, they would never receive a bill for Medi Medicaid. So that if there were ever a chance where the student received, say, speech and language services 
in their school setting, and then they also receive speech and language outside of the school setting, the parent might be worried that they could receive a bill because they can't get two services in a day. That would not happen. Um, in the event that the services were provided twice in a day in and out of school, then the school would just yield and not submit for that service. Okay, so that is authorizations.